Hello, everybody, and welcome to HardAssetsInvestor.com. I'm Mike Norman, your host. My guest today is Alan Valdez, who's the Vice President and Director of Floor Trading for DME Securities here at the New York Stock Exchange. Alan, thank you very much for coming on the show. Mike, thanks for having me. I know you're a busy guy. I see you all the time on CNBC, <laughs> so we're very honored to have oh, you on this show here. Thank now, you for having it's me. interesting for me uh, because I know you've been a longtime member of the New York Stock Exchange. 35 going, years. 35 years. Uh, New York Stock Exchange is, is the uh, epitome of, you know, the exchange, blue chip corporations, major American industrial companies. But talk a little bit about recent, uh, recently how we've seen uh, an embrace sort of of commodities, the listing of new commodity and raw material based ETFs really starting to to take off here. I know it's almost every day that I walk past the exchange, I see a banner of a company either yes. in the raw material space or a new ETF in this area. Is it surprising to you? Well, you know, it, it's the tail wagging the dog now. When, when I, ETFs first came down and people said, it'll never go. It, it's just something it's no really, one really they, wants they to give up. skeptics? No, and especially commodity-based ETFs. Right. I mean, they were never going to go anywhere. But now, like you said, they have just... Uh, I mean, the proliferation in those ETFs, when, when, I, when they first listed, I think it was just GLD was like the biggest listing uh, of an ETF. Sure, sure. That one. And, and now you see them copper. You see them all over the place. And, and they've just become so big. And the volume is so huge. And every trade I talk to does these commodity ETFs because they're winners. And you see institutions really gravitating towards them now, Without right? a doubt. Now, my cousin's up at Goldman Sachs, and they do a ton of ETF trading just in the commodity and the currencies. They are always there in, in those trades, do, and they're, they're very profitable. Do you, do you sense, like, uh, you know, if you step back a little bit and you see uh, suddenly something getting so big and popular almost like a fad in a sense do, do you worry that maybe it's getting too speculative like the the you know the embrace of, of commodities and etfs by the general public and the ease now that they could get involved through these instruments right. does it suggest to you any kind of frothiness or, or exuberance no I, I really don't i mean when, when i look back at dot com you could see that building up you knew that was a bubble that was going to bust i mean you'd come in and, and buy an etf at a dollar in the morning and it would trade up 50 or 30 points within hours and then back down i mean it was just crazy times but i, I do believe especially in the commodities that this trend is here and what's driving this trend is the it's like the QE3s or, or the or in Europe, in the G7 nations. It's, it's a drive. It's that volatility that I think is going to continue, and especially in commodities. I see that growth continuing. I mean, we talk about gold being a bubble. I don't think so. I think gold is more, uh, more trades like a currency now than mm -hmm. anything else, and more so than a commodity almost. And I think that's going to continue up because people are, are so uncertain about currencies, whether it's here in the United States, the dollar right. or the euro. And I think what's driving that is that uncertainty, especially especially in Europe. I think Europe's a bigger problem than America, but as a result, I think commodities are going to be in play in these ETFs, which are great for people to get involved in. I mean, uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather buy a GLD than actually the gold itself. I mean, it's just more practical for me. Yeah, which, which it seems uh, that's what most people are doing. But yes. let's talk about the GLD for a second, which recently, in terms of market capitalization, the GLD has surpassed the S&P Spider, the SPY. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, that is incredible. incredible. I, I Think mean, about that. Yeah, because yeah. The, the SPY is based on basically the entire stock market, the market capitalization, yet you see the GLD surpassing that. That's, that's unbelievable, right? Right. And again, I don't <clears throat> think that's a bubble. I think there's a shift going on where people are saying, hey, you know what? Get me out of get me out of currencies. Get me into something I can trust. And I think you're seeing that, especially in the GLD. But what does it mean for the historic role of Wall Street, which has basically been about raising capital for companies and industrial industries? And now we're seeing more people gravitate towards, you know, a particular raw material. Are companies kind of being left out? of the game now in terms of not being able to access capital where they used to go to Wall Street, that was the place to go to raise money? Well, you know, you bring up a great point and you're 100% right. If you look at the trades on the tape going across that tape up there, the big board tape, three quarters, 75% are held for under three minutes. 
indicative of ETFs trading, basically. And that's what you're seeing going on. So that raise of capital isn't there like it used to be. And you're seeing it reflected in some of these growth numbers in some of these large companies. Now, if you're going to, you know, 10 years out, if you're a young person buying an equity, say, uh, whatever, GE or, or an Apple, and you're buying a company, you're not, you're not looking for the jump in a week or two, then yeah, maybe there is some growth. But a lot of that has been diminished because of ETFs. And I don't think that's a bad thing because you know, ETFs can flip real fast. And I'd rather buy a stock going down if I'm looking long term right. than chasing it up. <clears throat> so, you know, and I do believe also ETFs too big to fail. There's nothing they can do with it. It's become so monstrous. If they would take the ETFs out or, or try to restrict that trading in any way, the tape would move backwards. Now let's talk a little bit about, um, I think you alluded to it, the volatility, the short term nature of the markets. And we've seen now the proliferation of uh, high frequency trading yes. okay which has injected a lot of volatility um how do you view that is that is that something good is that something bad is volatility here to stay are people looking at volatility now as an asset class unto itself like they just want to own volatility well, you see the growth in, say, the VIX and things like that. 20 years ago, no one even thought about the VIX. But you're so right. I mean, if you look at August, we just, we just finished this first day of September. We had a 10,000-point swing, intraday swing in the month of August. Unheard of. We had four days with over 400-point swings. Unheard of. August, the, mainly the slowest month of the year. Now we're coming into the busiest month, the most volatile month of the year. I don't know where the market will be a month from now, but I can guarantee we'll have volatility. I think what drove that volatility is the uncertainty, not only here, but in the G7 nations abroad. And that is staying with us. They haven't done anything to redeem those, those problems over there. What do you say to investors, I mean, who feel uh, a little bit less confident because they see this volatility, they don't want to get involved, it's scary to them. Do you just say to them, look, you know, embrace it, it's going to be here, you got to deal with it? Or, you, or do you see maybe a migration to other uh, exchanges or other regions? Well, you know, you brought up the, the key word is investors. I tell my guys, either you're an investor or a trader. Don't be both. If you're an investor, don't worry about the volatility because you're here for the long term. If you're picking a good company, a great blue chip company here that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and you do all your homework, then you, you should rest sure that it's probably going to go up. And it creates an opportunity because the volatility, volatility sometimes great can opportunity. cause that stock sure. or that company to get way undervalued. It gives a long-term investor an opportunity to get in at a very cheap price. No question about it. And I do see it as buying opportunities. Uh, we saw the market come in and capitulate about 1,000 points last month. Now it's up 1,000 points. If you had bought on the bottom, which a lot of us took advantage of, you're looking at, to me. It's like if, if you had a, a, if this was a mall, the stock exchange last month, the parking lots would have been full because we had such good sale items out there. It's great time to buy yeah. stocks. Now let, let's look a little bit at the international picture. I know the New York Stock Exchange recently acquired mm -hmm. by the Deutsche Termenbörse, uh, the the German exchange. Um, you know, not too long ago, something like that would have been unheard of because the New York Stock Exchange was the preeminent you know, sure. equities market in the world. Um, did that surprise you? I mean, how did you take that? You know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I've been here 35 years. At one time, we did over 80% of the volume. Now we're down to a little under 25. Still, we do the most out of any exchange, but you can see how it's been diminished. Surprised, but not shocked. I mean, you could see the trend in other markets just before Singapore emerged with Australia. You saw these mergers taking place. And it, we've become a global marketplace period and so these these are good mergers i believe this is a great merge especially from the derivative side i mean we'll have the biggest footprint in the world now with that so i i embrace it i think it's good i think change is good and i, I think this exchange will be here and i think it's great for the investor you have more merchandise to look at uh better executions cheaper costs so i think overall it was a great deal and you don't have a problem with the germans owning a no <laughs> you know i don't think they're such an it, icon like the it, new york it, Stock. you Exchange. know uh i this is wall street well, i don't live on those things but you know i could see some people saying oh no no more new york Stock Exchange." but it'll still be hey the, new the york japanese Stock own pebble beach and rockefeller center and where too, are they the, today yeah exactly you know? and finally i want to ask you you're, you're a floor guy you spent as you mentioned 35 years on the floor 
Do you think it was better in the old days when we had the special, when we had real human beings making markets as opposed to the machines? Well, you know, uh, again, we can't go back. But, you know, when I was here, 100 million share a day was a record day. I remember the first 100 million share a day. Now we do over a billion shares normally every day. Uh, we still have people involved. I mean, you saw the flash crash. I think you saw how important humans are in, in certain times. It's almost, I, I always equate it to a, a pilot of an airplane. You need a pilot to take off, but once you're at 30,000 feet, you can put on automatic pilot. And a lot of that happens on the floor. We have people there on the opening and the close, and then there's any disturbances. But otherwise, these things run themselves. You're 100% right. So I miss the interaction, the, the, the actual talking to people. We don't do that anymore. So I do miss that. But as far as streamlining a business, we got, we're much more productive now. Yeah, and we still have you, which is great. <laughs> Alan, I want to thank you very much for Mike, coming on the thank show. Thank you so much. Thank great you for having me. You. That's it for now, folks. We'll see you next time. This is Mike Norman signing off. Take care. Bye-bye.